This is, uh, so it's the changing, changing roles of and the societal attitudes towards robots, computers, and AIs. Um, we are dealing specifically right now with the 1900s to the present, otherwise we would be here for a few nights rather than 45 minutes. Okay, so um, I, I just want to make sure that people understood so that if, if you're wondering why we're not covering uh, literature, we will do a, a brief uh, covering of our, some earlier literature, but um, we're going to focus mostly on the 1900s to the current. Okay, so. You can start. Science, science fiction, like satire, has been a common and creative tool in addressing societal problems, fears, expectations. Today, many find it easier to talk about just about anything, especially with the anonymity of the internet. Science fiction has been a way to address subjects that are taboo or controversial by veiling them and disguising those subjects in entertaining, fantastic stories. For example, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, question the morality of man's attempt at creating life, thereby competing with God. The original Planet of the Apes movie series based on the books by Pierre Boulle dealt with racism, sexism, nuclear war, uh, that fallout of that, and other things as well. Sci-fi series like Doctor Who and Star Trek addressed issues such as militantism and peace, corporate exploitation of both people and environment, and of course, today's topics, robots. Our goal today for the remainder of this session is to show what those problems, fears, and expectations are and how they have been represented in film, television, and literature. When we hear the word robot today, what comes to mind is some kind of mechanicalized unit that's mobile, uh, includes some level of artificial intelligence. For the purposes of this panel, while there are structural differences between robots, androids, replicants, pretty much everything we discuss today applies to both, since we're not really going to talk about the science of how they're built. Cyborgs are tricky, we're really not going to get too much into those because there's a human element with that as well, and then there's the question of what's robot, what's human. Today's computers, along with, um, with cell phones and tablets, they're almost an artificial intelligence in and of themselves already. Where mo earlier computers had just enough computing power to flash a request to say, put in a disk. <laughs> Today's come with programs to make the comp computer learn about you the more you use it. It should be noted that throughout history, mankind has always imagined artificial man. This goes back as far as Judaism and the legends of the Gollum, Christianity with Eve created from Adam's rib, the story of Galatia and Pygmalion, which is a man who falls in love with a statue who com comes to life from the goddess Aphrodite, and many more be it through divine intervention, magic, or science. We have always been fascinated with the idea of creating artificial life. So let's look at some of the possibilities of why. Okay, so the first half of 20th century had a lot of defining moments that would create the framework for robots and science fiction, both visually and thematically. Now that's not to say that these were the only ones, but these were the ones that stood out uh, for creating what we have in our mind for a robot today. Um, Tic Tac was um, a character in Frank Baum's books. He's the one who wrote uh, Wizard of Oz. And he basically is really just a wind up, he's a great big wind up toy. He does not think for himself. Um, Baum repeats that re constantly. Even though he can speak, he speaks through his mustache actually, he doesn't have a mouth. Um, but he is a loyal servant and protector of Dorothy Gale, which is Dorothy of uh, the, the Wizard of Oz. What we have here is the, um, the original illustration by uh, John Neal, and that was the first time children saw a robot in some kind of book, okay? So um, again, he doesn't have, he's basically a big tin can, he was bronze, he was round. He's not in Wizard of Oz. He was in the 1985 um, movie Return to Oz, which was uh, also loosely based on Baum's books. And still he showed up as the big copper round can. Okay, so um, although he's considered a proto-robot in the literature because he doesn't really have any thinking capacity of his own. Okay, 
So the first time that we start to see something that looks a bit humanoid is Rossum's Universal Robots. This is where we get the term robot to begin with. Now, fact of the matter is, um, these robots are actually more like the replicants in um, uh, Blade Runner. They are um, modified humans, so they fit under that category. But since um, Carol Capek and his brother Joseph coined the term robot, they get to use it even if it's not 100% accurate. So this was a play, it wasn't a movie. Um, and essentially what it was about is humans make uh, artificial humans to do the crappy work, um, the dangerous work, the things they don't want to do. Um, what ends up happening is they are originally made with no feelings. And then a brilliant scientist decides it would be a good idea to give them feelings, which backfires. Because now they know they've got the crappy jobs. And now they're not happy. And they rebel. And that is one of the first stories we have of a robot rebellion. And it was in play form, remember, not a movie. So now, as far as movie form, 1927, um, Lang's uh, Metropolis, uh, originally in black and white, it's a silent movie. Um, when it came to the United States, unfortunately, um, it was severely edited. Um, if you have a chance to see the colorized version, you still gotta read the captions and there's not a whole lot. You have to guess what's going on. But this was the first time we actually saw a robot moving. Um, it, it was considered a mechanical object and it was so convincing that the, the, the story is about um, a labor uprising and the woman who is um, very significant in that movement, they want to replace her with a robot to lead um, the labor movement in the wrong direction, basically to destruction. So um, Metropolis is not a movie about robots, but it's about using a robot to replace, um, and that's something that is going to be seen. We see it in, in Doctor Who later, we see it in Star Trek, we're going to see it uh, in Stepford Wives and other movies later. The whole idea of using a robot eventually, having one so convincing that it could replace a person. Okay, so, um, and so that was 19, that was 1920, okay? These are the other, um, I actually have the section up to, up to 1949. So these are the other movies where there were robots and as you can see, so this one was um, from The Master Mystery, it was a, it was a serial. You can see these robots, they are not as advanced as Metropolis. They came before and basically they were just big tin cans, which is why we consider Metropolis to be a big move as far as uh, visual on the screen. There are robots in DC Comics uh, that Superman deals with. There's a mad scientist and he wants to rule the world, so of course he builds robots. Um, Bela Lugosi always starting creepy stuff and um, the phantom creeps were, um, they were all different kinds of monsters that had to, had to do with uh, misbehaving, when I say misbehaving, rule the world, uh, whatever. And robots became one of them because now it's becoming a staple in cinema. And then the mysterious Dr. Satan um, it was 1940s. So one of the things that all of these have in common is that um, the robots are always the bad guys. And the reason why is um, a couple things that we have to remember is the United States was pretty much at, in one form of war or another, uh, whether active or the Cold War, which is passive, for pretty much uh, most of the 1900s. Robots, like aliens, were a great villain because no one had a frame of reference. Um, robots were all fiction. Computers were mostly used by military science and uh, government agencies. So the average person didn't have a frame of mind about how much you could get away with claiming a robot, what intelligence they had. Um, it was also anonymous. You weren't directly pointing a finger at a government. You weren't directly pointing a finger at another country. So when the robots always want to come kill us, um, it, they were the perfect villain, okay? So, and uh, that, carries through um, substantially uh, up through um, 
to the, to the 40s and then there's a break. Now thematically, you also have to remember that, um, so Rossum's Universal Robots also dealt with, and you see this all the time, we, have, we, we usually use robots to do the work we don't want to do. Um, in the early 1900s, we may have been out of the Civil War, but um, Jim Crow laws still were in effect. Um, people of color did not have uh, any agency as far as labor laws. Um, the Industrial Revolution also uh, added to problems with labor laws because, believe it or not, um, corporate personhood actually, that idea started in the late 1800s. Um, with the big, big companies with Rockefeller and everything. Um, so labor laws were an issue, which is why you have a lot of movies with robots representing the, the, the suppressed labor, labor, um, labor class. Now, World War I will occur in uh, the, the second decade, and then World War II happens right after. Then we enter the Cold War, which in, during some years is passive. So that is why there is a lot of representation of wars, fighting, the robots are always the bad guys. Um, other things, that uh, other themes would be fears of being replaced. And okay, we see that in Metropolis, but we also see it um, later on in other shows, and it's usually for the worse. It's usually someone doing something wrong, um, wanting to impersonate someone for a political gain, or um, to replace someone that they want to get rid of. So that's uh, another thing. Imposters and, and impersonators and saboteurs and spies, basically. But also, we are going to see that robots are also, we have fears of them replacing us in our jobs. And that's not a new thing right now. That's not just been going on the, the, these past 20 years. It started, um, the first mentions that I found were actually in the 50s. Um, and then the last thing is the fear or distrust of technology. Humans are very resistant to change, um, especially things that they don't understand. And when we talk about computers, again, the general public had no uh, frame of reference for computers because it wasn't in the, um, the public arena. And from there, she gets the fun stuff. <laughs> I do get the fun stuff. I like the fun stuff. I get the heavy stuff. From the late 40s into the 50s, as the Cold War begins, robots start creeping into post-World War II life in cartoons. Uh, in the Looney Tunes shorts, we actually see a kind of bright future with things like the house, car, farm, and TV of the future. Through comedy, we are shown a bright world where robots and automation make living easier for everybody. Well, unless the automatic shaver decapitates you. But in a cartoon, you can live through that, so it's okay. We have robot features in Bugs Bunny's Robot Rabbit and Water Water Every Hair where robots are created by evil men, but they're not evil in and of themselves. And because of their programming and Bugs Bunny, obviously, again, through comedy, we start to see them in books with Isaac Asimov as he publishes the iRobot series. And then we begin looking at human-robot relationship. It's a series of short related stories, and they're very, very contrary to what we've seen for robots so far. Asimov came up with three laws. The first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. The second law, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first. The third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. He later added the zeroth law that precedes all the others, which is a robot may not harm humanity or by inaction allow humanity as a whole to come to harm. When he wrote these laws for his own works, they've been edited and adapted for pretty much almost everything in modern sci-fi. As you know, we see it in Doctor Who, uh, when robot has a breakdown in program given to him by scientists, it conflicts with his original program which includes not harming humans. Bishop and aliens, when Ripley finds out he's an android, she freaks out. Well, 
after the ash bottle, they were a little twitchy. So newer ones are programmed not to harm humans. Lieutenant Commander, da Commander Data, next generation, always cannot harm another living being except in defense of another. While Asimov did not intend for his laws to be universal, not only does pretty much everyone use them anyway, but many were quick to point out that they were even then still problematic and that they were set to keep robots under control. Even if a robot were to follow these laws, that does not mean they would always do right. We can look at Robot and Frank 2012, which is an elder care robot that basically helps his client, his patient, to feel better by going out and stealing things. <laughs> I didn't lie, I get all the fun stuff. <laughs> um, these laws speak not only, uh, they speak to actions, not morality. So the robots still at this point, they don't have any concept of right or wrong. In 1951, we get the day the Earth stood still, which is a double whammy. We have an alien and a robot coming to Earth at the same time. Um, the two things most often used in sci-fi, which is generally to scare the public into submission, but instead of automatically seeking to destroy us, Klaatu and Gort are here to be diplomatic and could actually help prevent the Earth's destruction. But Earthlings are too busy fighting amongst themselves, being petty, and just not realizing that there's good to be had there. Again, we see robots and technology as a positive or a potential positive to mankind. 1956 brings us to Forbidden Planet, where we first get to meet Robbie the robot. He's the first robot that starts having personality. He'll go on to be featured in other films and is listed as a character in his own right. When we start to see a shift is in 1957's Kronos, where an alien machine is sent to siphon energy from the Earth. But that's alien created, right? So we're back to bad people or aliens creating bad machines. I'm gonna leave you with one more positive perspective as we leave the 50s and enter the 60s. It's another cartoon. I like cartoons. In the early 60s, it brings us to the futuristic family of the Jetsons, where for the very first time, we see robots that fall in love with, with Rosie and her handyman, Matt. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Robots are great. So I get the 60s. Now, the 60s, we had a lot of great science fiction shows and almost all of them didn't really like robots. Um, Doctor Who had several robots and computers that showed up, and I'm talking mostly the classic series because we're talking 60s. Um, he even at one point makes it clear, I don't, be, I don't believe that man was made to be controlled by machines. Pretty much every machine they come in contact with either wants to kill us or wants to kill somebody else and doesn't want to kill us, but well, we're collateral damage, so it doesn't matter. Or they want something from us, and it's devious. Uh, Doctor Who also gets like copied as an android, uh, so we have that. We're, we're back to that whole spy thing. Um, but Doctor Who basically was very, very, very anti-robot, anti-android, anti-computer for the most part. Um, up until we do get. We do get a, we do get a few good characters coming up, but the so Wotan was the computer, okay. Um, Autotons were they were like android robots. So they went Doctor Who went the spectrum. They, they the computers they got the androids, and then he finally makes a friend. He has a dog, a robot dog. Um, now the the thing about the positive things that Doctor Who tried to bring out about robots is that they're still glitchy, they still need to be charged, they still malfunction. Um, he's one of the, it's one of the first shows where we start talking about um, another person coming in and hacking and hijacking the program. And that kind of takes away from the fact that well, now you, you've got a, a good, you know, something good about robots. 
The first time that we meet one that you actually feel is a sympathetic character, he's simply named Robot, and he is supposed to be, supposedly, the story goes, or at least this is what Doctor Who was told, that he will do jobs that are too dangerous or too heavy or too complicated physically for humans. The problem is that was um, kind of a, a, a lie. He's actually made by someone who belongs to a secret science society that wants to rule the world. The problem is Isaac Asimov's rules come in. He's been trained not to harm people. And yet, under the new rules where he's being told by scientists to kill Doctor Who and his companions, he has essentially a breakdown. So you feel bad for him, but you are well aware that Doctor Who still stands that robots should be monitored, they should be watched, they can't be in complete control because they're not reliable. The one other um, robot that was a, a sympathetic character, again, for a short period of time, was Chameleon. He was under the control of the doctor's, uh, one of the doctor's arch enemies, the master. And Doctor Who easily gets him to switch sides. He frees him, he rescues him. It doesn't last long because although Chameleon has some level of sentience, he's weak-willed and he falls under the programming of the master um, in very little time. So the bottom line is Doctor Who still maintains that robots are glitchy, that they will malfunction, and they cannot be, they should not be uh, in control of humans. Now, Star Trek, Star Trek, not so good with, with didn't love robots so much, not big on computers. However, they were a little bit more sympathetic to androids. This was the M5, and this is from the Ultimate Computer. And this is one of those times, um, one of the two times that I found in the 60s from a series where you actually had someone verbalize that they were worried about a computer taking their job. Uh, the whole premise of the show was, if the M5 did well in its field test, then uh, about 400 people on the Enterprise would no longer need their jobs. And Captain Kirk is very dismayed about that. Um, However, needless to say, he fails miserably, he malfunctions, he kills people, he causes uh, destruction of uh, several ships. Um, so basically the theory there was, no, people are better at their jobs, leave the machines under human control and not the other way around. Um, this was Nomad who basically had an identity issue. Um, he's called a changeling, he kind of, um, uh, imprinted on Kirk. So again, it was the whole idea that machines will always have a fault. And if they have a fault, then someone can control that fault. Basically hacking. Now when it came to androids, Star Trek was a little bit more lenient. Usually what happened is the androids themselves were not bad, much as Joyce was talking about a little while ago, but rather under the control of somewhat questionable characters. Um, Kirk actually kills an android with emotion because that's Jim Kirk. Um, what happens is they land on a, a planet and um, they meet a man and he has a daughter. It turns out she is an android and he actually has lured them there because he wants her to experience love and emotion. She's been very isolated. She's very good at studying, but she hasn't really made that human connection. Unfortunately, it turns out that uh, her program cannot handle the emotion. Um, it can't handle, uh, it, it, it overloads their circuits. Um, they're not really very scientific about it, but pretty much he kills her. So, now two others with androids. What are little girls made of? And this is the one with Christine's boyfriend who was on a planet and he has made androids. And the androids, again, themselves, they are not bad, but they are under, um, Corby is looking for fame and not necessarily, he's just misguided. He's not a horrible person. He doesn't want people to have to die anymore. Um, he's, he's an idealist. 
what he doesn't understand is that the androids he's created, again, they don't have the human condition. They do not feel. Um, it, it's, it's not the way that most people would want to be preserved because they would be missing the whole part of what life really is for a human. And then the last one we can, we can enjoy a little bit is MUD's, robot, uh, Mud's uh, androids. They're made to be incredibly irritating, but they're not evil. They're just under MUD's command. Um, and we actually have the last laugh when they put MUD in with several copies of his wife. So, now, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone took any theme you could have and made it creepy and weird. Um, but in the Twilight Zone, it still covered some, still some very um, important issues that people were worried about. And again, um, there's Robbie. Robbie the robot comes back only instead of being the good guy, he is now uh, a bad guy. Um, the robots that are presented, they're, it questions whether or not it's a good idea. So this one is called The Lonely. It's about a convict. He is going to spend the rest of his life on a planet and they decide to give him Alicia, who is an android, and he just doesn't want anything to do with her. He's there, she is there basically to hopefully accommodate his needs, but again, it's the lack of the human condition. Um, it, it's, it's, it's that one step that we'll talk about Commander Data later, cannot cross. Um, then there's an interesting one, uh, and I always get the title wrong, The Lateness of the Hour. It's about a young girl who's very upset with her lazy parents because they have robots all over the house to do everything for them. She finally convinces them to please get rid of the robots, and the father does. And she figures, great, we can go out, we can have fun, and they're like, no, it's too dangerous. She starts to put two and two together, and unfortunately finds out that she is a robot. At which point she has a breakdown and they make her the maid. So um, again, now we're talking replacement issue. And this particular, um, this one in particular uh, is noted because we see this in AI after. Um, parents replacing, a, a, use, using a robot as a replacement for a child. So, um, is Rod Sterling with, with Robbie. Like I said, Ro Robbie the robot cost $100,000. In that time, that was 10 times more than a house. So Robbie became um, a pop star icon, even though a lot of the roles were, he was like the bad guy, kids loved him, so. And then the last one is Lost in Space. No, the original robot in Lost in Space is not Robbie the Robot, but he was made by the same man, so that explains why you see similarities. Also, Robbie the Robot also starred in three of those shows. So, he went to go visit his cousin. Um, <laughs> robots, for the most part, again, they're always out. They're either controlled by someone who wants to take over the ship or wants the resources, or Dr. Smith is selling, willing to sell the Robinsons to get something. Um, so again, robots are always the adversary, except in two, um, well, except in one case, except she, she shows up in two shows. This is Verda. Verda shows up. Dr. Smith orders her. This is very interesting in space. They're lost in space. They can order an android. Um, and he gets her, and then the humanoid who uh, is responsible for selling her wants uh, payment. Um, and basically, she stays with the Robinsons, and she... Um, she escapes that way, and she does come back for another show later. Um, those are the only two instances of a really sympathetic robot. Um, and you gotta feel bad for our robot friend. I had to pick this in. He falls in love. Just like Rosie and Mac. Just like Rosie. The only thing is, um, she's only out for game. Basically, she's, um, she's bait for trap. So, then there's Space 1999, another one, doesn't like robots. You start out with Brian, and you feel bad for him because they find him on a planet, and you assume that something tragic happened and he got left alone. It turns out he was the one who was causing the tragedy. So that was Space 1999, and there wasn't, um, it was a short-lived series, for those of you who know it, one of my favorites, but still short-lived. Um, again, it always amazes me that all these space movies, for all that they don't like robots and computers. 
all their ships are run by very big computers. So, she already talked about that, and that's her baby. <laughs> Actually, it's best our black to keep up a little bit. So, my order is a little different. That's okay. But that's okay. That's okay, because my favorite is next. <laughs> The big, the big supercomputer of them all, homicidal Hal. So, 2001 is um, the uh, Space Odyssey by Kubrick and Clark. Um, Hal is supposed to be, he's that calming voice, and basically he is a computer that is supposed to see to the needs of the ship and the crew. The problem is there is a conflict when the crew disagrees with how he should, with how they should handle the mission, Hal takes over because in Hal's programming, the mission comes first. Unfortunately, he decides to kill the crew. Um, we don't have any information on the specifics as to why that worked out the way it did. Obviously, he, he didn't read iRobot either. Um, we found out in 2010 that because of the conflict of programming, Hal did what he thought was best. Um, unfortunately, it's very sinister in 2001 the way he does it because he basically leaves um, the astronauts out to suffocate in space. So for those of you who don't know, um, Hal does get better. In, um, he goes all the way to 3001 and helps us defeat the monolith, which is actually another supercomputer, which doesn't want to always be on humans, uh, humankind's side. They help us evolve, and then at one point they decide they don't want us anymore. So, and now I will let you go back to you. From the late 70s into the 80s, there was, again, another shift for how robots and computers are portrayed. Um, going from Boom and Doom and Now to Destroy Us to being a little more user-friendly. A couple of likely reasons for this. Though it would be another decade before the Cold War was technically over, it really pretty much was over. Um, my parents had things like air raid drills. Anybody here ever have that? No, it's not part of it. Um, another reason is in the 70s, while the microcomputer was of interest mostly to just technicians and hobbyists, the personal computer of the 80s had a much more affordable price tag and made this tech accessible to everybody. Um, so now, how do we get people on board with technology? Even those who couldn't afford a computer or see, see all the benefits of only one were still exposed to them in businesses, colleges, libraries. This exposure gave people a better frame of reference that they didn't have before. And the companies making them needed to be able to like them and not be afraid of it. 1977 brings us the biggest sci-fi franchise ever. And I want to hear you people. Da, 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 da. Come on, seriously. I'm so let down. Star Wars. Robots and machines are now helping whatever side they're on. The most basic background, we have the icons of R2-D2 and C-3PO. R2 brings cute comedy with his bells and whistles and small stature, while being fiercely brave. <laughs> and his counterpart, 3PO, brings rationality, morality, and judgment, while remaining comical in his fastidiousness. Next, and mostly due to the success of Star Wars, we get 1978's Battlestar Galactica series, which is an ancient race of alien humans fighting the evil Cylons. We even have, for the first time, a human Benedict Arnold, who decides he'd rather be with the Cylons. We have that in the character of Baltar. Uh, interesting side note that I found while doing this, the creator of the series, Glenn A. Larson, was Mormon. And almost all of his ideas come from the Book of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> from the 13th Lost Tribe, the Council of Twelve, the idea of marriage for time and eternity, and even their home planet, Cobol, is an anagram of Kolob, which is described in the Book of Latter-day Saints as a star or planet. 
but I digress. <laughs> Back on point. One of the first programs where people learned to use, or one of the first programs people used to learn use on a computer was word processor. Everybody, it's you know first thing you do when you're in school. Uh, Stephen King wrote Word Processor of the Gods, which is about a man who his word processor gives him the power to write things into or out of existence. He quickly, obviously, finds that there are consequences to this. <laughs> now that people actually knew what computers were and what they did, a story like this could be entertaining. But that frame of reference discouraged the kind of phobia that goes with scientific unknown that we saw in the earlier half of the century, when people had no frame of reference for what computers or robots or any of that was. In Blade Runner, with Harrison Ford, we start to have the ugliness of humanity. Um, obviously, Harrison Ford's bounty hunter's job is to retire all the replicants. If I retire, we mean to kill. <laughs> Um, it also begins to blur the lines between man and machine. Now, my personal favorite of the 80s movies, War Games. Matthew Broderick is a computer hobbyist. Like, just like we mentioned, he finds a backdoor into a national security computer program, and both the computer and the juvenile hacker think they're playing a Cold War game. It reaches a point where the computer thinks it's real. Though still war-related to US versus Russia and a bit dark, it brings to light that computers should never be, have unchecked power. We also hear for the first time, as far as I could tell, that this computer had actually been programmed to learn from its mistakes. So the first AI. In the end, we see the culmination of years of being on edge with the Soviet Union summed up in one line that the computer says, and that he learns in a matter of minutes. If only our politicians could do that. <laughs> Strange game, the only winning move is not to play. Since we weren't looking over our shoulder for fear of another world war, robots began taking on different roles. And even when robots were still the bad guys, there was also usually a bigger picture. Terminator, for instance, was not about a renegade robot, but rather a cautionary tale, much like in war games, where it's the system that the humans create they eventually can't control, in this case, Skynet. By the time Terminator 2 comes around, some of those robots are now on our side. Same as in the Sarah Chronicles. The Sarah Connors Chronicles. Yeah. <laughs> we all saw Arnie as the Terminator gone peaceful protect protector in more recent incarnations. 1987 gives us Star Trek The Next Generation and Lieutenant Commander, Commander Data. Unlike the robots portrayed in the original series, he is meant to be likable. The android was accomplished, having earned his rank. So we can say that Star Trek finally warms up to robots. Now that's not to say they didn't have their problems. It showed data on several occasions, either malfunction, half his pro programming hijacked, experience confusion over others' emotions, and struggle with his own self-awareness. Hmm, that sounds terribly human, don't you think? The 80s also brings us likable robots in films specifically designed for a younger audience. We have Short Circuit. Johnny Five, which is built for Cold War, but escapes after lightning strikes him into consciousness. He's cute, he's friendly, he's funny, he's a little gullible. That gets him tr into trouble in the sequel when he gets involved with some bad guys who want to use him to their advantage. Transformers brought us back to the long-standing traditional good versus evil theme, only this time it's between Autobots and Decepticons with humans in the middle. An alien race of robots with essentially all the good and bad qualities of people. And yes, remember how in 2001? In 1984, we get 2010, the year we made contact, and we see the HAL 9000 back to the way he was before his breakdown. Soft-spoken, concerned, helpful. We meet Dr. Chandra, the creator of the HAL 9000. We learn that he had spent years in between trying to find out what went wrong with HAL and experimenting with a twin model called Sal <laughs> when he has the chance to actually retrieve HAL and evaluate it it is found that Hal's behavior was the result of conflicting programming, in other words, human error, not its own fault. Chandra treats Hal as his, his, his long-lost son and is very, very protective. Now, interesting to note, the timeline between the events in the movie is only about 10 years, but in reality, 2001 was written in 1968, 2010 was written in 1984. Uh, well, the movie came out in 1984, it's based on the 1982 book. If 2010 had, actually been written 
only a few years after 2001, would Hal have still been portrayed as a more sympathetic character and the victim of bad programming? Or would it have remained a villain like so many computers and robots in Doctor Who of that time? The world may never know. Also in the 70s, there were movies that had a lot to do with replacing people for one reason or another. Um, Stepford Wives is about a group of men in this nice little quiet town where everything seems perfect, where basically if you're not happy with your wife, you can trade her in for a model of herself, which is very submissive and uh, pleasing. It didn't end well, not in the first one and not in the second one, so before anybody gets any ideas. Um, first Westworld, and I definitely want to cover it because we're ending with the new Westworld. Playground where the rich can go and do anything seemingly to anyone without consequence. Now this goes back to, we create robots to do things that we don't want to do, or that are too dangerous, or that's crappy work, or that's too tedious. In this case, we're using robots as a form of entertainment to probably feed our darker side, and that's what that show is about. Now the first Westworld, the the robots malfunction, you don't have the reason why during in that movie. It doesn't matter. They just malfunction, and when they malfunction, they malfunction tragically. Um, you do find out in Future World, they do give a little homage there. They do say that it was human error, and they decide that the best way to fix that is to have robots tr um, controlling the robots. So they have robots in the, um, the control room controlling the robots out on the grounds. Now, Future World, you find out two, um, two journalists go in to find out how much Westworld has progressed. Have they gotten all their problems out of the way? How are they sure it won't happen again? Only to find that the new Westworld is actually a place where they are replicating uh, heads of state, important people. They actually want to replicate the two journalists so that they don't write a bad review. Um, and what they're doing is they're putting these important people and in the form of robots back into the real world for their own gain. So the 70s was still very much robots are still bad. When Joyce talked about Lieutenant Commander Data, this was a turning point because in the, 19, the, nine, late, uh, the mid 1980s to the 90s, we start seeing a turn where the themes are more about relationships other than this robot will work for me in this capacity. We start seeing relationships. Both Commander Data Lieutenant Commander Data and the Doctor from Voyager, they hold positions, they have friends, they interact. Um, Data is still a bit short on the human experience. You see him struggle, you see him have a relationship with someone and not quite understand why she's unhappy with him when he's trying very hard with what he thinks she needs. Um, he explores the human condition through music, through acting. He tries very hard. But through the entire series, he still always falls just short. The Doctor has a little better luck, but he's an AI who's a hologram. So he has his own sets of limitations. But the one thing these two characters have in common is that they changed the view of Star Trek to be far more uh, sympathetic towards robots and androids and actually have them incorporated into regular shows rather than the occasional story of maybe they're good, maybe they're bad. Also, you, um, you start paving the way for um, relationships that came about later. Um, as I've said, both of these characters have relationships with humans. Um, we go into the 90s, and we're going to see more of that. We start, though, with kids, as Joyce brought up, a lot of fluff for kids. They're great movies. 
uh, the movies with morals, you know, um, while it has to do with the environment, what happens when we didn't take care of the environment, things like that. But there was a lot of cute movies for kids, but p adults were still the ones buying the technology. So at that point, you really did need to address how adults felt about ro robots, about androids, about the possibility of these things working with you um, or, or waiting on you. So we start looking at relationships on a far more personal level. So Bicentennial Man, basically a family buys a robot to do menial chores around the house and then he starts to have emotions and that is something that the family has to deal with. Um, AI was very much like the lateness of the hour where a family whose child is uh, sick, terminally ill, and in stasis, um, the father decides that adopting a, an advanced android would be the answer, at least for the time being. Unfortunately, when the natural child comes out of stasis, the mother uh, obviously um, bonds with her own child and leaves um, David out in the cold. So David goes on a Pinocchio-style road trip because if he does not win his mother's love back, he will be destroyed. So now we're starting to talk about the moral issues. What is our responsibility of the things we create? Uh, iRobot is the same thing. We create a race of robots. Well, once you create a race, do you not have an obligation towards them? Do you have a right to just shut them off when you're done with them? Um, especially when they start to have some kind of self-awareness. Even the Cylons in the new Battlestar Galactica are more complicated than the robots in the old series. In the old series, there was the good guys, there was the bad guys. You knew the Cylons because they all looked the same. With the new hybrids that are more android looking and they're very, they're indistinguishable and the fact that there's more copies. So you might have a good six and you have a horrible, terrible, evil six, only complicated things. The series really did explore the fact that nothing is black and white. Um, we talked about uh, Robot and Frank, where now you might have a robot that actually uh, deals with you um, on a personal level for your needs. So the rest of the movies, because I'm getting my one minute warning, all the, um, Humans and almost human have to do with actually having people work, uh, having people work alongside robots, and the reactions, the kind of prejudices there might be that you saw in Alien Nation or that you see in the workplace now when we bring new workers in. And last but not least, um, Westworld. Westworld deals with the consequences when you've created something almost so perfectly and it reaches self-awareness and finds out you created it to, as a form of entertainment or as a worker or something that you created to use and abuse, break and then rebuild and go, do it all over again. What would their reaction be? What would the consequences be? So the bottom line now where we are is We've got AIs, we don't really have advanced computers, but we've got AIs that talk to each other, that we have to be careful what they do, we don't want another Skynet. Um, what is our responsibility in containing the things we don't want to get out of hand? Because we are an illogical uh, species and logical robots will have problems with us. But what happens when those robots reach self-awareness and want to be they want to be individuals or have a certain level of independence from us. What is our responsibility to us then? So, I believe I hit my time. Hopefully, um, is there any questions, any quick questions that I could do in like a few seconds, a minute? Well, thank you for your patience. I know we flipped through 120 years pretty fast, but thank you very much. And um, I saw a lot of you uh, nodding, so you obviously knew some of the shows we were talking about, which makes me feel a whole lot better. because I'm I like, really I can see you on that. I really, I really did try really hard to pick a good cross-section for several age groups. 
and it's hard when you're not sure who's going to be here. Thank you all very much for coming.